Good to be with you tonight. Good to be here. Count it a blessing to be here with you and uh, driving through the fog and seeing the moon like it is and uh, coming into this warm facility. So many things to be thankful for. Thankful that you're here tonight to continue studying some things pertaining to uh, the soul. We're going to be looking at church discipline and the family, and this will conclude my material on this. I uh, invite you to investigate the scriptures, and these things are so find ways to make applications of these things in your lives. Thank you, John, for reading this text. Uh, that's where we're going to begin uh, this evening, talking about... Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20, and how we are warned to not show favoritism. It's a warning against favoritism, and favoritism can be a problem in churches. It can be a problem anywhere. The Bible shows it. I mean, Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac favored Esau. Rebekah favored Jacob. Jacob favored Joseph. Joseph's brothers hated him for that. Over in the New Testament, we know that uh, some were favoring Paul as a preacher, some were favoring Peter, some were favoring Apollos, right? And so there's this favoritism that comes in, and it only causes and sources evil. In the epistle of James, in chapter 2, he warns against showing favoritism. In chapter 2, verses 1 through uh, 4 is all we're going to read for tonight. But moreover, brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come in to your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man with filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there or sit at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? It was a problem here in the assembly, uh, showing partiality toward those who were wealthy and despising or scorning those who were less. That's an example of what James is giving on to not be partial, to not hold the faith with partiality. And so he's warning against showing favoritism. Uh, this word, show partiality, you have shown partiality, is translated from one Greek word. And it is linked with the ill-reasoning judges. So showing partiality is linked with judges without reason. Okay, that's what James is connecting that in verse 4. It is a word that is translated in the context here, going back to chapter 1, is doubting. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 6, the same word is there, where it's shown partiality in chapter 2. Here it is translated doubting, but let him who ask in faith with no doubting. Uh, with no doubting. And the idea, of course, is differentiating, differentiating, where you're making a difference between this and that. He says you don't hold the faith making a difference. The, the faith is going to be held in common. It's a common salvation, a common faith that we have. And so the point that I think James here is making and that we're, I'm going to make tonight is that showing partiality is not influenced by the faith. It's influenced by something else. And as we look at the faith, we must understand that we must uphold it and not waver. This showing partiality or uh, doubting or differentiating is found in Romans chapter uh, uh, 2 or not two, but Romans chapter four, verse 20, with the example of Abraham, where at the promises of God, he did not waver. That's that same word. He wasn't, he wasn't divided. He wasn't split. Okay? He wasn't saying there's a double standard. He wasn't living that way. He was firm and holding to the promises of God and not wavering. And that's how we must be with God's word in everything. Faith is to be held with partiality. My friends, the blood of Jesus Christ should be thicker than any blood that runs in family lines. It is for me, and I hope that it is for you. It's something that we are called for and called to do. Jesus made this uh, distinction. He, made, he shows us by example of the elevated relationship that disciples have even over familial relationships. In Matthew chapter 12, we read in verse 46, the Bible there showing us our Lord's example when his own family came to visit him. 
In Matthew chapter 12, 46, when he was talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brother stood outside. Matthew 12, 46, they were seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. Understand the positioning here. They are standing outside. They're not inside. Okay? There's already this division that's starting to occur here, the outside versus the inside. And though they were his mother and brothers here, we don't subscribe to Catholic doctrine that, that elevates Mary next to God. She was not in the right relationship here. Okay? And his brothers were not in the right relationship here. And Jesus, Jesus actually withdraws from, from them or separates from them and elevates something that's more precious in the sight of God. And that is the disciple relationship. He, notice verse 48. He answered and said to one who told him, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples. To whom did he stretch out his hands? My disciples. You can almost see Jesus stretching out his hand to his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. The disciple relationship. Mary enjoyed that disciple relationship in Acts chapter 1. She was listed with the disciples. Right? And his brothers would also come into the fold and enjoy that. At least James. He became a very influential leader. But we should never hold the faith with partiality and it's been a problem for some. You hear about it when family comes and visits, all of a sudden members that are normally there aren't there at worship services because my unbelieving family members have come up, and so I want to stay home and entertain them. That's, that's not holding the faith pure. And so as we, as we look at the Lord's example here, he elevates the disciple relationship and separates from that relationship from the family. We need to see the important lesson there, do we not? So some of the early advice that was given to me when I was training to become a preacher uh, by Johnny Edwards was preach as if you do not have a friend in the auditorium. That is, you're not going to be partial. Whatever the Bible is saying to this person, it's going to say to that person. So it doesn't matter whether they're friend or foe. It doesn't matter whether they're relatives or non-relatives, neighbors or travelers through, you preach the same thing. And Paul, of course, would preach the same message from church to church because Romans 2.11, there is no partiality with God. And I need to see that. You know, sin is still sin, whether it is a young person involved in it or an elderly person involved in it. Whether it is a rich man, poor man, whether it is a male or female, whether it's a preacher or an elder or a member or a Bible class teacher or a new convert, sin is always sin. It doesn't change with the person. It's still malignant and it's still dangerous and it still opposes God. And so we're, we are in, in you know, kind of a battle zone sometimes where to uphold the faith with Christ, to stand with Christ, will sometimes, not always, but sometimes it will cause division in the family. It's not fun. It's not pleasant. It's, it can become a war zone. Jesus, if you're in Matthew 12, you know, you just go back a page or two and you come to chapter 10 where he clarifies in verse 34, do not think, Matthew 10, 34, do not think, what not to think? Jesus said, do not think. Well, what should we not think? Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What kind of sword? It's not a physical, literal sword. I think it's something that pierces even deeper. <laughs> and it's the familial sword. He says, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Remember, this is prefacing what we just read in chapter 12. 
He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And so this is the conundrum that we're sometimes in. In the faith, we know that his commandments are not burdensome and that his yoke is easy. But then we also know that straight is the gate that leads to life and difficult is the way. So on the one hand, it's easy. On the other hand, it's difficult. On the one hand, his commandments are not burdensome. On the other hand, we are to slay ourselves and bear our, bear our cross, right? And so there is a sword that's involved there. There is commitment and there is cost and there is a crucifixion. And so I must always go back to what my Lord, my Savior, my God requires of me. You know, as we talk about discipline and family, can it, can it be said that an elder... It can provide an exception toward his son when his son is in, involved in error. In my first work when I was preaching, we had elders, and they invited uh, the one, what they invited a son of one of the elders to come and preach a gospel meeting. And he came and he preached. And there are some things that he said there that just frankly, brethren, are not true. They're not true. They're not sound. He was bringing in unity and diversity, teaching. For example, that we have all kinds of things in common, even if we don't have doctrinal things in common. We must have doctrinal things in common to have anything that matters in common. But it was, it was differentiating from what matters to what doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you and I have fishing in common or rodeoing in common or race car driving or football. That doesn't even matter. What matters is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He also taught that when it's all said and done, we're saved by faith only in front of the church. Then he started teaching the elements of 2 Peter chapter 3 were, that were melted with fervent heat are actually the elements of the law of Moses. Now, I don't know how you get the heavens being on fire and the earth melting with fervent heat being the elements of the law of Moses. That's what he taught. I asked him, are, are you supporting AD 70-ism? No, I'm not doing that because that's common with them. That's how they, that's how they approach the scripture. Well, I'm not doing that. Well, I don't know what you're doing, but I know one thing you're not doing. You're not speaking the truth. You're not teaching the truth. The elders should have corrected that. They should have. But if it's a family member, do we give them a pass? No. What's our verse say? I've submitted 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, and, you know, this is an okay translation. It reads pretty similar to the New King James. Um, I don't prefer that translation to the New King James. It's a very heavily Baptist translation for the New Testament. But they do a pretty good job in 90% of the New Testament. <laughs> and it's a good second or third uh, translation to have. Um, there can be a whole lot worse. But think of the charge here. I solemnly charge you. This is not, you know, take it lightly. This is, I want to arrest your attention, Timothy. I want to solemnly charge you before God. And who else? Christ Jesus. And who else? The chosen, the elect angels of God. That you observe these things here without prejudice. And without what? favoritism or partiality, right? So it's important. What it says to you is what it says to me is what it says to the person next to you and across the pew to you, okay? It doesn't change. And so I need to appreciate that. You know, there can be a, a scenario where, and there are scenarios, and I have seen these scenarios in the church, where there can be elders, an elder, a man who's an elder, and his son is the preacher. And I've also seen it where that son can become also one of the elders with his father serving as an elder. Now, do they hold each other accountable the same way they would non-family members? They must, right? They should. They can't say, well, because we're blood-related, now the rules are different for you than they are. No, they're the same. That applies everywhere else. And so if the son of an elder begins preaching false doctrine, what must the elders do? They must do whatever Titus and Timothy tell elders to do. Okay? 
And if the father, the elder of one of the, of the eldership, if he begins teaching error, upholding error, what must his son do? He must also talk with him and try to recover, try to reclaim him, try to save him, and if need be, expose him. Okay? It's the same. And so the Bible always requires action to be taken against any saint that persists in sin. Over in the Old Testament, we have Moses giving the commandments here in writing the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 13. And he says, if there arises in chapter 13, verse 1, a prophet among you, a dreamer of dreams, who gives you a sign or a wonder, and a sign or a wonder comes to pass, of which you say, uh, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, let us serve them. You should not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God, fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord. Skip down to verse 6. Now, remember what Jesus said about set you against mother and daughter and son and son-in-law. If your brother, the son of your mother, your son, your daughter, your wife, the wife of your bosom or your friend who is as your own soul, your best friend, secretly entices you saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, neither you nor your fathers of the gods of the people which are around you, near to you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent with him or listen to him, nor shall I pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, you shall surely kill him, because your, uh, your hand shall be first against him, to put him to death, afterwards the hand of the pe- all the people. Uh, and you shall stone him with stones until he dies. Now, this, of course, was the way that sin like this was dealt with in the Old Testament. This is not the way the New Testament church disciplines people. We don't take them out and stone them, right? The war that we have is within our minds, within the arguments that are framed, and we cast those down and we destroy those. We don't take the person out and literally stone him. But it shows God's disgust for sin, and it shows the lack of partiality that should, that should be in play here in, in Deuteronomy chapter 13. And so this put away from yourselves the evil or the evil person. This is reiterated in Deuteronomy 17, verse 7, for the idolater, for the rebellious son in 21, or for the sexually immoral in 22, verse 21. And so it's it's restated in all of those different areas, but this is the thing, brethren. That phrase that's found in Deuteronomy 13 and these other places is also found here in 1 Corinthians 5, 13. Okay? So Paul and these people, you understand the Jews would have understood that and picked up on that, and they would have known exactly what that context was. And they would have instantly gone there and associated these contacts with contexts with what Paul himself wrote there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And so we also should understand that uh, too. Chapter 5, 13, those who are outside God judges, therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. Quoting from, again, the passages that we just referred to. So put away from yourselves. Remember what he said in chapter 5, verse 2? That he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. There is a separation here that is being taught. You're putting it away, putting him away. And so the subject is anyone named a brother. Those who are on the inside. Remember we talked about Matthew 12? Jesus says, you know, they were standing on the outside. says, those here, these are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. And Paul makes that distinction here. There's the inside and the outside as well. He says, what do I have to do with judging those who are outside in verse 12? Do you not judge those who are inside? Inside what? A car? A house? No, inside what? The church, right? Inside the church. That's who we judge. And that's a part of being a Christian, is to hold each other accountable uh, that way. And so as you look at uh, the sin, that, the specific sin that was involved here, a man having his father's wife, it takes two to commit that sin. It's not a solo sin, right? It takes two. Yet who's being judged? The woman is not. 
as you go down through this text, you see the emphasis placed upon the man. Notice in chapter 5, verse 2, you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he, yes, that's who's involved here, that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you. Not they, but he. In verse 3, for I indeed absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him, not them, but him who has done this deed. In chapter 5, verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan. One. There's just one here you deliver to Satan. Why? Because she's not a member of the church. She's not a Christian. She doesn't come into the rules of discipline. We don't judge those who are on the outside. But we do hold those accountable who are on the inside. And it's not so much withdrawing fellowship. And I've used that phrase a lot withdrawing fellowship it's not so much withdrawing fellowship fellowship is maintained by having fellowship with god that you also may have fellowship with us notice here that john is saying you may have fellowship with us not that you automatically do but you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship this us and our is with whom with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We have fellowship with God, right? You may have fellowship with us. How? How can you have fellowship with us? He says, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If our our horizontal uh, fellowship here is based on our vertical fellowship with God, our vertical relationship with heaven, So when he has, he's taken his father's wife, he is no longer in fellowship with the father. He's no longer in fellowship with the apostles, right? He is violating law. He's violating scripture. He's violating Jesus. And so fellowship is also spiritual. Bible fellowship is. There's a bond that's broken here. And it's broken because we've transgressed the commandments of the Lord. I cannot claim to be in fellowship with you if I'm beating my wife because I'm not in fellowship with Christ, (laughs) right? That fellowship is, is broken down when we live in sin, when we walk in sin. We don't have fellowship with God. What's being taken away here is the keeping company with, not even the eating up with such a one, okay? And the delivering over to Satan that man is recognizing now that he's no longer in grace. He is now in disgrace, non-grace. He is living in Satan's domain. And that he may have the destruction of the flesh and through that come to his senses. So the family, of course, God designed the family to be the basic building block of society, and and it is the center for love. It's the center for training. It's the center for godliness. And as we think about the family, it it is a source of strength. It's a source of spiritual, physical, uh, emotional strength. It becomes a haven of rest and peace and joy. And so we see that in many different places. We see in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, that from childhood, Timothy knew the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make him wise for salvation. From childhood. Well, how did he get that wisdom, that knowledge? From the family, from the home. We see that when God created Adam, he said in chapter 2, verse 18, it's not good for man to be alone. And he remedied that by doing what? To remedy the not good. Everything he made under heaven, he pronounces it as good. But then he looks at this and he says, that's not good. Remember that after every day? This is good. This is good. This is good. But when he looks at man without woman, what does he say? It's not good for man to be alone. So he creates Eve to become the companion for man. There's strength in that bond, that union between a husband and a wife, a male and a female who are joined together in holy matrimony. There is a strong uh, uh, sense of worth and attainment and value and honor and glory there. And then when 
the family grows, uh, we see the strength within the family in the Psalms. And in Psalm 127 and Psalm 128, uh, this is a, a very strong theme in those two um, Psalms that are written for us. In Psalm 127, he describes uh, the children as arrows as he talks about the house here. Psalm 127. Notice in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like the arrows in the hand of a warrior. You think of a bowman. And he has that arrow in his hand and he pulls that thing back and that arrow he lets go and it zips to its target. That's what he's comparing here. The, the metaphor of a warrior with his arrows, a, a long range warrior is what the man is here with his children. So he's crafting that arrow, making it so it will take on the role, on the course in which it's to go. And when he shoots it, it's going to head. It's not going to deviate, waver. It's going to go right to its target. So here we have, like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with their enemies at the gate. That's strength. Chapter 1 in Psalm 128, verse 3. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. That's strength. That's a blessing. That's glory. She's the one that makes that house a home. She's the fruitful vine that makes it living. Right? in the very heart of your house. Your children are like olive branches all around your table. That's the family as God describes it. And if my family's not that way, I need to be asking myself, what can I do to make it that way? But the point that I'm making here is sometimes it gets broken. Sometimes the family suffers. And we see that recur throughout the Bible. The very first was the first generation. You think of Cain and Abel, brothers. But Cain doesn't regard his brother. And we know from Genesis chapter 4, verse 8, that they're talking, they're communicating. But we also know with Cain that he has an insane temper. And when the Lord respected Abel and his offering, and he did not respect Cain or his offering, we know that Cain became what? Verse 5. Not just angry, but very angry. And God calls him out in verse 6. Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? And the Lord counsels him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Yes, I accepted Abel and his offering. You gave me something I never wanted. I didn't ask for it. I'm not going to respect that. I'm not going to look upon it. I'm not going to gaze at it. I'm not going to approve it. If you do well, though, I will approve it. But what's Cain's response? Well, we read in verse 8, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field. Remember, Cain is a tiller of the field. When they were in the field, Cain rose up against his against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Well, why did he kill him? The New Testament tells us why he killed him. In 1 John chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 12, that because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. You know what they're talking about? They're talking about wickedness and righteousness. They're talking about good and evil. They're talking about worship. They're talking about what is right and what is wrong. And you know what Cain's answer to that is? I know how to silence you. And he rises up against him and kills his own brother. But you know what? It didn't silence him. His blood cried up from the ground, didn't it? The Lord knew what had happened. He was accountable, Cain was, for what he had done. But it tells me that Abel was talking to him about righteousness. Abel's actually mentioned in Scripture as being a prophet. In fact, we would say he's the first prophet found in the Bible. And Cain was of the wicked one, living like Satan, believing like Satan, endorsing Satan. I'll tell you this, Abel wasn't murdered because they disagreed about what sport was better than, a, what team was better than another team. They weren't out in that field swapping recipes for food. 
They weren't out there having a conversation about holiday plans. No, his brother was exposing his error. Cain wasn't going to put up with it anymore. And he rose up against him and he killed him. Sometimes the family can become a source of heartbreak and disappointment. Why? Because sin likes to ruin everything. Sin takes what is beautiful and it corrupts it. It destroys it. It mangles it. And so we ask here, what then about a defiant child who's independent versus a defiant child who is dependent? As I mentioned this morning from passages from Proverbs, if he is dependent on his parents and he's being defiant towards religion and towards worship, well, what's the answer from, from the Bible for that? You know, in Proverbs, the 20th uh, chapter here in Proverbs, we read in uh, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 30, that blows that, uh, blows that hurt cleanse away evil, as do stripes the inner depths of the heart. There's a physical punishment that's involved here. And so just because someone says, I don't want to, doesn't mean that we say, well, you know, you just have to make up your own mind. We'll respect that. No, when we say it's time for dinner, if you're living in our house and we say it's time for dinner, what is it time for? dinner. <laughs> so, so come and eat. Say it's time to go to bed. What's it time for? But I don't want to. I don't care. You're living in my house. You're going to go to bed, right? What about when it's time to brush your teeth? Well, you know, I think you need to just, you know, this child just has to have time to know whether or not he really feels that it's important for him to brush his teeth. We don't do that anywhere else other than religion. And I need to understand that The Bible says that he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly, Proverbs 13, verse 24. So he can be made to do and to develop a palate to do what is right. Righteousness needs to be palatable. And the way it becomes palatable is by me testing it, teasing with it, eating it, testing it out doing it, practicing it. If, I'm, if I say, no, I don't like broccoli, then I'll never like broccoli until I start eating it. But I don't want to eat it. Well, then I eat it and it's not that bad, right? It may taste terrible at first, it may taste like dirt. But can I develop a palate for it? Maybe, <laughs> but I won't know until I try, right? Parents have to make God palatable, have to make Christ palatable. We taste him as newborn babes, that he's gracious. I need to learn how good he tastes. So I'll leave you with that thought. What about the defiant, independent child? The one who is no longer under our control. Well, that's exactly one of the other references that, we, that Paul was referring to in 1 Corinthians 5.13 when he talked about putting away the evil from the land. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 21. And the Old Testament describes exactly a defiant, independent child who would not conform to what is right. Chapter 21 of Deuteronomy, verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him, bring him out of the, to the elders of the city, the gate of the city, and they shall say to the elders, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious and will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. He's an adult. He's a glutton and a drunkard, right? But they can't control him. He's uncontrollable. Well, under the Old Testament law, again, we're not under the Old Testament law. We don't have that punishment, but under the Old Testament law, all the men of the city shall stone him with stones and be put to death. Disobedience to to parents is criminal. It's criminal. And he, though older, was refusing to obey what they had asked him to do. He would not conform. So my advice is, rather than keeping company with someone who's older and independent, I would encourage you to enact exactly what the Bible calls the church to do. Because you know what? Family members are going to have a stronger influence than anybody else upon those who fall away. That's, I'm not making bones, you know, any, any more bones about it. That's just the fact of the matter. 
you're going to have more influence on your children than anyone. If the whole church does what's right, but the family says, no, we don't want to do what's right, what's going to happen? It's just like the child I mentioned this morning. When we tried to bring him to his senses, you can't support LGBT <laughs> and be a Christian. And they remove him from the church and go to another. Well, he continues to grow with that. And he leaves the Lord. And he gets in trouble with the law and all kinds of other things. We've got to show them the way that is right. Rather than engaging in mundane activities, come on over and let's watch a football game. Gear your conversations towards his soul and his condition. I want to leave you with Luke chapter 15. I did mention this last week. I want to just add a little bit more to it because what we have here is truly an independent child who is rebellious to his uh, father in Luke chapter 15. And I know that it's a parable and I know that it's a three or a triune parable and everything in it is lost and we have the value of everything in these three different parables increasing from a uh, sheep to a coin to a son. And it tells me that God, God Almighty understands the difficulties that parenting can have with children that are rebellious. And this father here has an outward rebel and an inward rebel, but for our purposes tonight, and I can preach, trust me, I have several sermons just on this one chapter, but I have to just keep it very microscopic for tonight's lesson because we're out of time. But you read that a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, give me, father, give me, underscore that, give me. Who's he interested in? Me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's his, that's his God, that's his idol, that's his manner of life. Give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided his livelihood and not many days after the younger son gathered all together on a journey, a journey to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. He asked, give me, give me, give me. He commands it, he wants it, I want it, what is mine? As soon as he gives it to him, what does he do? He splits. A few days later, he's gone. Takes the money and run. And what does he do with the money? He wastes it all with prodigal living. We read in verse 14, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and, 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 sent him, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine, which is absolutely repulsive to a Hebrew. But this man would do it. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. He had left the glories of home to eat with pigs. As a Hebrew, you're looking at this and you're thinking, that is absolutely terrible. But we see people leave the diet angels food heavenly food to consume pig food today now what are we eating and consuming when we leave this and embrace human doctrine human theology right it's the same thing as this young man saying i'll take the food even from the pig's mouth and he came to himself I'm sorry, in verse 16, would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And I want you to underscore verse 16. And no one gave him anything. So he goes to a far country and no one gave him anything. That's separation. No one there's giving him anything. And his father's not coming. I wanted to check on you, son, and make sure everything's okay. No, he's not doing that. No one is giving him anything. Here, life in separation becomes his teacher and this is what we're all hoping for when someone departs from the Lord is to get them to reflect not deflect anymore this young man as long as he was there having this rebellious attitude with his father in the home he's probably not going to reflect he's going to deflect everything his father says and so he runs out he goes away but he's not enabled, but rather he is disabled. He spends it all. He spent everything that he had. And when he re reached the bottom and no one gave him anything, we read in verse 17, he came to himself. You know what that's saying? He came to his teaching. He came to the person, he came back to the person that he was taught to be. He came back to the teaching that he had from his parents, from his house, from his home. 
He came back to that man. You see, sin takes us away from ourselves. It makes us lose who we are. Our identity is tossed away. If I leave the Lord, I need to fill the separation so that I will begin to reflect on my own decisions. And he came to himself. And so important that is, that he makes this resolution. I will go to my father's house. Notice he says here in verse 17, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And to spare, and I perish with hunger. What's he doing? Perishing with hunger. Remember when I talked about the physical sometimes can become an aid to spiritual? He's perishing with hunger. Deliver such a one, does it remind us? Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. He's out there in Satan's domain and his flesh. He's getting ready to perish from starvation. And no parent would want that on their child. But you know what? It's going to become a lifeline to bring this child back to his senses. He says, Father, I will rise and go to my father and say to him, I have sinned against heaven. Notice it's no more deflecting. I have sinned. Not you made me sin. Not it's all your fault. Not it's the environment that I grew up in. Not it's my neighbors. Not it's my friend. No, it's me. I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am not longer, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's humility. And I want you to underscore the very next two words, because this is what this all looks like when a person comes to his senses. When he comes to himself, he wasn't his self when he said, give me, in verse 12. Notice those two words, give me, in verse 12. Verse 19, notice those two words, make me. Make me. I don't want you to give me anymore. Just make me. Make me like one of your hired servants. All I would rather be a servant of yours than live the life of sin away from you anymore. That's humility. That's resolution. And that's what we want. But it's never going to begin until they feel the effects of separation. Then they re- self-reflection. And then they can make a I want to go back to the one, the man that I used to be, the woman that I used to be. And he followed through. And when the, when the father sees him coming, here in, in, in verse 20, he arose and came to his father. He came there. He didn't expect his father to come to me. He came there. If we ever find ourselves without our God, it's because we are the ones that moved away to a far country of sin. He hasn't moved. And when he came, he was still a great way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on, on his neck and kissed him. You know who this man is. This man is a nobleman here in the parable, a nobleman. There is no nobleman. In this history here, in this culture here, that's going to just start running with his robe on and running to his son. Noblemen don't do that. But he did it. And you know what? This tells you and me something about the God that we worship. He doesn't care about that. He instantaneously receives sinful men that come to him. And the son follows through. He, he begins to tell him this. He, he said, I have sinned against heaven in verse 21 and in your sight, no longer worthy to be called your son. But what does the father do? He reinstates him. Bring out the best robe. Put uh, the sandals on his feet. Put a ring on his finger. Kill the fatted calf. It's instantaneous. There's not going to be any more talk about what you have squandered, about the, the debt that was raised. There's not going to be any more talk about... Uh, this, this uh, probationary period. I'm not going to hold any grudge or any of that. It's instantly restated, instantly forgiven. And so when God forgives, he forgives instantly. And I want to leave you with this last thought. I want you to really just reflect on it. The way the father viewed the son when he was away. The way he viewed the son in verse 24. This, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to make merry, or be merry. When his son was in sin in the far country, when he had walked away from what was right, that son was dead, a word that we understand as if he had breathed his last. He stopped breathing. That's how the father treated him. That's how the father looked at him. He is dead. That reminds us of 1 Corinthians 5, too. 
they were puffed up and you should rather what? Mourn for this one, right? My son was dead. But not only is he dead, he's lost. That's our word for perishing. He said he was going to perish with hunger. He has perished. He is lost. He is destroyed. He is ruined. That's what that word means. But now he is found. He was dead. Now he is alive. Understanding this point here in verse 24, my son was dead and is alive again, speaks to me on how he interacted with his son. It's as if he is dead. Spiritually, he is. Spiritually, he's broken. Spiritually, he's ruined. And so what does this mean? It means our relationship changes. It means our relationship changes. Our conversations change. Our holidays change. We used to enjoy meals together. That changes. You can't call up someone from the grave and say, let's have one more meal. You can't do it. Rather than playing, replace it with praying. Rather than social mundane activities, replace it with a view to return to the Lord. As dispassionate and as humble and as loving as you can, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. I'm going to err. I'd rather err a little bit more on being patient than impetuous. That doesn't mean I'm going to be neglectful. It doesn't mean that I'm going to sweep the dirt under the rug, pretend it doesn't exist, bury my head in the sand. But I'm going to be patient, patiently calling. Brethren, it comes down to a trust issue. Do I trust the Lord to navigate me through difficult times, whatever those times are? Even if it's a child that I love and I'd give my life for, and he goes astray. Well, I trust the Lord that I'm going to do all that I can in humility to correct him, but then I'm going to also recognize if he's incorrectable, if he doesn't change. I'm not going to throw pearls before swine. I'm going to turn him out and let him through the destruction of the flesh, hopefully and prayerfully come to his senses. Knowing that, I'm looking for an opportunity that God will perhaps grant him or her repentance. And how does he grant that? Through time and opportunity. So that they, the person that that's, needs corrected, may come to the truth, for it's the truth that sets us free, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. I want them to know Satan has captivated you, and there is a key that releases you from his prison cell it's the truth and it's this it's not my feelings it's not my i think so's this is what jesus himself validated with his resurrection and it will outlive me and i recognize that not necessarily everyone will come back to the lord who leaves that's the sad recognition of it but i want to do all that i can do right to try to get them to come back. And also recognize this, that when you're doing these things, that you are now resting your head on your pillow in hope and in calm. Just because those we love leave the Lord doesn't mean that our faith now needs to be buried six feet under. We need to stand as icons of strength, humility, but as a light that shines even brighter than before, knowing that we have the light left on for you and we want you to come back and listen to me. It may or may not happen in your lifetime, but even when you die, if you leave an example of faith, 
your life story is going to continue to be a preaching sermon in that son, that daughter, that grandchild's ear through the rest of their days here. And yes, they do sometimes come back even after. Okay? I've seen many come back when people do what's right. I can't recall any coming back when I've seen them toss the commandments of the Lord aside. I just can't, I can't recall anyone coming back when, when these things were not done. So I don't want to leave the lesson without offering an invitation. I appreciate how you listened tonight. I wanted to finish out the series, so I took a little bit longer. But if you're not a Christian, we certainly want to encourage you to become one. And if you are a Christian, you know, you've, you've believed, you repented, you confessed, you, you were baptized into Christ, and now you find your way in sin. Perhaps you even find your way away from your God. And you may not be here. This stuff is put on, and I appreciate Nick uh, putting this online on YouTube. It could be someone listening at a distant area. And all of these sermons, although they're not consecutively given here, like one after another, they are put in a playlist there. And you may be listening to this, and, and I want you to recognize that the prodigal son with his father underscores the efficacy of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But it also underscores verse 8, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Okay? When I have sinned, I need to just confess it. I need to repent from it. God is faithful and just, not to forgive some, but to forgive all of our sins. That's what the verse says, all, all of our sins. So if you're subject to the invitation, if we can help you in any way, if we can pray for you or help you in any way, please come as together we stand and as we sing.